what uh, lobster shells are made of? Weird. This is, but I'm not talking about that family. I'm not talking about the, the fungi are not on the table tonight. <laughs> it's just too freaky. <laughs> so in plants, Bergson thought, that cellulose sheath prevents movement and it protects the plant from stimuli of the sort that would keep an animal awake. So basically, Bergson thought that plants could, be af could afford to be stoical just because their cell walls are so hard. He said, he wrote, the plant is therefore unconscious. But of course, plants do move sometimes, as when an acacia leaf folds up in response to a light pressure. But he wrote, in the exceptional cases in which a vague spontaneity appears in vegetables, it is as if, as if we beheld the accidental awakening of an activity normally asleep. Bergson presumed a relationship between mobility and consciousness, writing, the humblest organism is conscious in proportion to its ability to move freely. And furthermore, Bergson reserved the highest state for those beings that are truly capable of responding to duration, uh, of differentiating in unforeseeable ways. And so, he privileged animals over plants. But let's think some more about the ways that plants move. In fact, as Bergson acknowledged, and as contemporary science confirms, plants are quite motile. When a predator threatens animals, they can pick up and run. But plants, of course, have no choice to, but to stand their ground. That was Bergson's whole idea. That's why they developed thorns, um, hard and hairy seed pods, and other f physical barriers to predators that might chomp on them. And it's also why they produced a chemical arsenal of uh, insect repellents. Plants move a lot. They turn toward the sun, of course. Uh, their, their petals open at certain times of day, like the, the flower, the southern U.S. flower called the four o'clock. Uh, their vine tendrils reach out and twine around anything that will support them. Amazing to see in a stop motion film. Their roots push obstacles out of the way as they grow. And as leaders, readers of uh, Deleuze and Gattari know, plants travel through underground root systems, the rhizome. Deleuze and Gattari's central example of the rhizome is couch grass, Eltrigia ripens, which is considered a noxious weed in many places because it infiltrates vigorously, and given its rhizomatic character, is practically impossible to eradicate because if you destroy the, a part of the root in one place, the plant will keep growing somewhere else. So it sounds like Bergson was inaccurate. The difference between animals and plants doesn't lie in our ability to move and plants' inertia. Let's try another angle to think about how plants communicate, to think about how plants consume and produce signs. Now for this, I'd really like to use the semiotics of Charles Sanders Peirce. I see that some of my students are in the room who are also big fans of Peirce. <laughs> right, Carolyn? Yeah. Peirce is the best. You, I mean, really, people are all kind of crazy about Whitehead, and I will be talking about Whitehead, but almost everything that is in Whitehead was already there in Peirce. And Peirce's papers, um, many of which were unpublished during his lifetime, are in the archive at Harvard, I think, where Whitehead uh, had his tenure. I have a feeling that there was some, uh, some, um, a little bit of thievery going on. <laughs> so, yeah. A strong influence. A strong influence, but most, <laughs> mostly unacknowledged to, uh, my, to my awareness. Maybe not. I mean, I haven't really researched that. Anyway, Purse is great. In Purse's semiotics, everything is a sign, and every entity makes and interprets signs. He describes an infinite chain of interpretation, a constant flow of semiosis. Peirce's way of thinking allows us to see the universe as composed of spa a spiraling, ever-transforming, growing and dying um, swirl of signs. Peirce also wrote that everything thinks, quote, 
Thought is not necessarily connected with the brain. It appears in the work of bees, of crystals, and throughout the purely physical world. And one can no more deny that it is really there than that the colors, the shapes, etc. of objects are there. Peirce did consider the interpretant of a sign to be conscious, which uh, limits the semiotic process to human thought. But it's possible to tweak Peirce's logic just slightly to, think, to consider that signs are not only communicated among conscious beings, but among all things, and that semiotics is a constant process of material communication. And I, I credit that interpretation to the philosopher Floyd Merrill. Plants, then, are completely enmeshed in the world of swirling signs. Plants receive signs from the, the rain, the wind, the temperature. They receive signs from insects and birds. They receive signs from each other, mostly chemical signs, as I'll, as I'll discuss more soon. They receive all kinds of signs from us humans as we plant them, prune them, harvest their fruit and flowers, run over them, subject to fumes from cities and factories. And the plants think about these signs. That is, they take them in, mull over the best response to make to them, sometimes in communication with each other, and produce new signs in response. They bend, wilt, spring up, flower, grow, uh, grow seeds, lose their leaves, they thicken their bark when threatened, uh, they produce more fruit if they think they're going to die soon, they invite insects to pollinate them, they warn predators away and warn each other of predators. The Estonian biologist Jakob von Uschkol had a beautiful conception of life as a poly polyphonic music of co-evolving creatures. He really emphasized how each of us becomes what we are because of the way we have evolved with other creatures. As a snapdragon evolves in interaction with the bumblebee, uh, the mammal evolves in interaction with the tick. And probably some of you know uh, the way a Deleuze adapted from Ishko's son. Uh, discussion of the tick. He proposed that every animal is surrounded by an umwelt, kind of like a, a soap bubble that encircles you and through which you perceive the world, um, perceiving only, part, only those parts of the environment that matter to it. So every species has its own way of perceiving the world through three things, uh, orientation space, such as uh, in us mammals, our semicircular ear canals, uh, tactile space, and visual space. Fonushko wrote, each of its perceptual senses bathes the living being in a world. So it's humbling and beautiful to try to put ourselves inside the umwelt of other beings and perceive the universe from their perspective. For example, uh, you might have come across this uh, beautiful news item last year about the, uh, the humble dung beetle that uh, we think of as not perceiving very much of the universe at all except for the ball of dung that it rolls around. But in fact, the dung beetle orients itself by the Milky Way. This is why they know where to roll their balls of dung. Because the bright, bright light in the sky at night tells them which way to go. So we can start to think of the umwelt of a plant, which would in include uh, light, air, soil, water, chemicals, and animals, all of which it feels, hears, sees, and smells. OK, time for some examples of how plants communicate chemically. Plants inform each other of stress, such as infestation and drought, so that they can respond to it. And they're like, uh, they work in teams. For example, a study of Pisium sativum, the field or garden pea, shows that plants inform each other about drought through the roots. The plant's skin, is, any, any plant skin, is covered with microscopic pores called stomata. And in drought, the stomata uh, close to prevent dehydration. Some experimenters planted Pisium sativum in shared pots 
and they mimicked drought by applying the chemical mannitol to one plant. And then they measured the aperture of the plant's pores, or stomata. And 15 minutes after the experimenters had injected mannitol into the one plant, its stomata and that of its neighbor, the neighbors sharing its receptacle were closed by 39%. And after one hour, drastically closed to conserve water. So you see what this means. This means the one plant that was actually suffering drought communicated likely through its roots to its neighboring plant. You better close up your stomata, my friend. <laughs> so this shows that stressed plants communicate to unstressed plants, and the unstressed plants respond even though they are not suffering themselves. In turn, the unstressed plants release stress cues to other plants, creating, the experimenters say, cascading chains of stress responses in more distant plants. Is it only between uh, plants of the same species? Probably but I'm not sure. I'm going to give you some examples soon of plants that actually um, compete with each other and would not want to share information. <laughs> but honestly, that I don't know. I don't know. In fact, I, I, would, I would not say probably. I would say maybe. I don't know. Plants also communicate to insects. Now, a lot, reading this uh, um, uh, botanical literature, I find that all the cabbage cabbage stroke mustard family is a very popular um, experimental plant, uh, especially uh, a tiny, very modest little plant that's part of the mustard family. It's like the, the fruit fly of, uh, of botany. Everybody loves to experiment on this small, wild mustard. Uh, and you might know that all the uh, cruciferous vegetables, so your cabbages, your um, uh, Brussels sprouts, um, mustard, canola, um, you know, all these plants all around the world share these properties. So the things that I'm about to describe are really are common to a big, big family. Um, okay, so a uh, cabbage, Brassica oleracea. When Brassica oleracea plants are infested by the diamondback moth larvae, they emit volatile chemicals that attract the diamondback moth parasite. Um, yeah, so rather than, I, I'm actually jumping ahead of myself, but that's okay. Um, uh, rather than uh, attacking the ins directly attacking the insect that is attacking it, the, the brassica will invite another insect to come and attack the insect that is attacking it. Um, and the chemicals that it emits include green leaf volatiles, terpenoids, and aromatic compounds such as indole and methyl salicate. Um, oh yeah, one of them, this is actually important, one of them is jasmonic acid, which is a wound hormone, which act activates the expression of protease inhibitors in attacking insects. Uh, so this is actually one way that the plants do attack the insects that attack them. Um, and so when the attacking uh, diamondback um, larvae try to eat the cabbage, um, these uh, protease inhibitors prevent them from producing salivary glands that they need in digestion. So you see what a, what a, clever, what a clever name it is. Mm. A 2009 study in the Journal of Chemical Ecology reveals an operatic drama animating plant-insect relations. When butterflies mate, the male, this is just, oh, the male often deposits benzyl cyanide into the female butter butterfly's eggs. Benzyl cyanide is an anti-aphrodisiac that discourages other male butterflies from mating with the female. Protecting the first male's paternity. <laughs> However, <laughs> the same chemical proves to be indirectly lethal to the progeny of the butterfly because when the female deposits her leaves on the on her eggs on the leaves of Brussels sprouts, another of these cabbage family plants, 
The traces of benzyl cyanide prompt the plant to emit a chemical that attracts parasites to the eggs. I find this really hard to understand. So the Brussels, so the male, the female butterfly, she's just going to lose out because she loses her children. The male butterfly has this kind of a suicidal um, uh, pride that makes him want to protect his paternity over everything else. The Brussels sprout has this Machiavellian kind of plotting going on um, to, to um, kill, to att attract the parasites to those eggs. It's very, very complicated out there. Okay, so now I would like you to please uh, open up your olfactory slides. Uh, and uh, there's 15 of these, so please share them. And um, there's two bags marked one and two. Would you please uh, open number one? And smell it. You're asking the feelings of the smell, or what is it? Oh, both, both actually. Oh. It, it's not, I think it's really good to, just, to try to um, identify the qualities of the smell before you uh, come up with what it is, because that really kind of makes it smell better. Yeah, like a decade. Great. Uh -huh. Great. 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 Uh, in some uh, northern parts of the U.S. 
But uh, more specifically, um, we are smelling the balsam firs cry for help. I will explain this. <laughs> um, when a plant is infested by an insect, it can respond in several ways. I've already described a few of these, but here's, um, here's a kind of sequence of what happens. Um, when a herbivore, herbivore attacks a plant, often the first thing that the plant does is immediately release a sticky goo to trap the insect. I'm sure you've all seen that on various kinds of plants. Um, some plants emit toxins that sicken the attacking insect, um, while tobacco poisons its attackers with nicotine. Isn't that interesting? That, so nicotine evolved as a poison. Um, however, there are specialist uh, herbivores that can tolerate these toxins. So that's really interesting that the more the herbivore intends to attack exactly this plant, the more the plant will not be able to fend it off. Um, so in these cases, the direct defense is not necessarily the best defense. And that's when, as I just described with the, uh, the um, uh, Brussels sprout, the attacked plant takes an indirect defense emitting chemicals that do two things. They attract carnivorous insects, so insects that will eat the attacker, um, and they warn other plants. An infested plant emits a complex cocktail of chemicals, and the thing is, these are different from the usual cocktail of, chemi of chemicals that a plant yields through ruptures in the skin, the kind that you would get when you just nick a plant. Um, plant physiologists have been studying this indirect defense since the 1980s. Uh, recently, they're mostly studying on the community interaction among um, complex systems of plants. So what the, what the plant does is um, uh, to produce these chemicals, it will attract uh, carnivores to eat the predator or its larvae, is they rearrange the transcription of their DNA inducing genes that uh, produce phytohormones that allow them to emit, uh, it's just a bunch of chemicals that are all called uh, herbivore-induced plant volatiles. It just means chemicals that you would produce if you were being attacked. Um, and they have uh, many different components. The thing is that they get to work fast. Um, within hours to days of infestation, a plant starts to produce these chemicals. So this is why, I mean, I, I would love to be able to do this experiment myself, but uh, I so far haven't. This is why there would be a difference between the kind of chemicals that are emitted when you initially just um, happen to nick a plant, you know, in passing, and the kind of chemicals that are emitted when a plant realizes that, it really, that it's really going through long-term stress, um, such as infestation. And that's when it produces these other herbivore-induced plant volatiles. So I would really like to smell the difference between them. Um, I think it's so interesting. Oh, also, that um, depending on what the, uh, what the attacker is, plants go to the trouble to eliminate, uh, to emit uh, different odor ones. Uh, and uninfested plants, um, sensing that call for help, respond by heightening their own defenses. So the predators of Abies balsamea include moose, squirrels, birds, and the caterpillars of the low moth, um, as well as human harvesters for turpentine and Christmas trees. So when it is attacked, I couldn't find data exactly on the um, balsam fir, but I imagine that it does similar, similarly to what the Scots pine does. So here's another of these dramatic stories. When sawflies deposit their eggs on the Scots, plant, Scots pine, the plant changes its metabolism of clupinoids, and after three days, it's able to attract a wasp that will eat the uh, sawfly's eggs. So once again, this indirect defense. And uh, the title of the article that explains this phenomenon is, A Plant 
notices insect egg deposition and changes its rate of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting that this uh, botanist uses, these botanists use an intentional verb. The plant notices that it is in danger and acts to defend itself. Um, the scientist Marcel Dick, uh, in his approach to the behavioral ecology of plants, also emphasizes that plants make decisions. Um, because when a plant is working out its uh, on self-defense, um, this diverts the plant's energy from photosynthesis, and so it needs to decide whether and when and for how long to produce those chemicals that will attract predators. So plants are doing a lot of calculating. They really are thinking. But I have to also tell you that in this botanical uh, literature that I was, I was reading, there, there is a critique among them. Some of them don't like this uh, kind of intentionality. Some of them find it anth um, anthropomorphic. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think you're know, deciding, thinking, mulling over. You know, rather than uh, saying that uh, these botanists are projecting human qualities onto the plants, we could consider that they're pointing out that um, we are like plants in the way we weigh our decisions. So, uh, a few people noticed a uh, Vicks vapor rub, uh, other kinds of uh, clean, uh, cleansing sorts of odors, and if you ever use or your mother used a pine saw or other kinds of uh, pine scented cleaners at home, you know that um, uh, these, uh, these piney scents, they connote cleanliness. So they have this cultural connotation. But this is actually because they have a function of cleanliness. Um, not only for, uh, for us humans, I guess they kill some kind of microbes and bugs, but uh, also, plants um, use those volatiles to attack herbivores. So when we use uh, some, a pine-scented cleaner, we really are behaving like our plant cousins. Um, so of course, we humans also emit olfactory calls for help, right? When we're in danger, uh, or when we feel disgust, that is when we feel fear uh, or disgust, the odor of our sweat changes. And, uh, and our, our peers smell the changed scent of our sweat. And uh, even, if, even if they don't know the cause, they share our feelings. So if you feel fear and break out in a fearful sweat, uh, the people around you will too. Uh, and act appropriately, for example, by fleeing. <laughs> <laughs> Together, you know. <laughs> Suggesting that that uh, clean, fresh smell of the balsam fir is actually the balsam fir tree's call for help. And uh, sadly, it was um, calling for help precisely because it was being milled into this uh, refreshing oil for human use in the butt of Whole Foods. So it's, it's sad. Um, so that odor may give you a brisk and fresh feeling, the result of uh, having uh, successfully eradicated your enemies. Uh, yes. Okay, so by focusing down at this chemical level, we're getting a picture of a world of constant micro communications. And it sounds like the world of Alfred North Whitehead, a continuous process of transformative encounters. Whitehead's process philosophy proposes that the universe consists of interacting entities that constantly perf uh, transform in their prehensions of one another in a series of atomistic encounters. And Whitehead's term prehension supplants the more usual term perception, um, perception implying different sense modalities. Instead, the term prehension um, the pre uh, the, the hand in it um, <clears throat> suggests a grasping that does not distinguish between sense modalities and includes both physical prehensions and mental prehensions, and furthermore, does not distinguish between conscious 
uh, conscious entities, uh, living entities, and non-living entities. So it's, it's very, very democratic. Now, it's important that Whitehead's thought focuses not on enduring entities, but on encounters. And I have to say, this is not only Whitehead. This is um, all of process philosophy shifts the focus from substance as the fundamental um, entity of the, the universe. Um, yeah, so it's not just Whitehead. Um, there's a big fashion, there's a vogue for, for Whitehead right now. Um, I've been trying to read a little bit more widely in other process philosophy. And uh, what we are really enjoying about Whitehead is actually true of this branch of philosophy in general, as far as I can tell, is um, instead of considering that uh, substances are the, are the ontological fundamentals, most of us have done ever since Aristotle. Um, process philosophy uh, says that processes are the fundamental entities of the universe. It's very refreshing and exciting to think of the world this way. Um, for any of you who are interested in uh, Islamic philosophy, I've been working on Mullah Sadra, um, the great uh, um, 17th century Persian process philosopher. So if you're interested in Mullah Sadra, come and talk to me. <laughs> um, okay, so Whitehead, yes. So Whitehead's thought, like, like all process philosophy, focuses not on enduring entities, at, but on encounters. Um, interestingly, this leads to uh, a process grammar um, in which Whitehead rejects subject predicate forms of thought, which really enforce a sense of stasis in things. He encourages us to abandon the copula um, and the exam, so try to, um, try to remove uh, the is, are, was, were from our sentences and, and replace it with verbs that indicate things that are, are going on, transforming and changing. And his example is, we shouldn't say the tree is green, which suggests this equation and this you know, a static state, but the tree greens. Um, uh, emphasizing that trees are living, changing entities. So uh, the process grammar, that's my term for it, but uh, getting rid of the copula and focusing instead on, on what changes um, helps us to, to appreciate the flux that is our, our common property. So what this term prehension, for those of you who haven't uh, been reading Whitehead, prehension is the act by which, oh, there's going to be another term coming up in the definition. Prehension is the act by which one actual entity takes up and responds to another. Um, so any individual of whatever duration is composed of prehensions or data um, from other entities. And its prehensions in turn become data for others. So it's easy to think about how this happens in, in the life of a plant, the leaves of a plant Prehend sunlight, uh, photosynthesis takes place because I don't know the chemistry well enough, but the cells are prehending something, turning into something else. Uh, the plant's roots prehend soil, water, rocks, things it has to grow around. Um, uh, and the water and soil prehend the roots that are moving in it. So everything is prehending everything else. Um, and each Thing, each of these uh, actual entities feels itself being changed in the encounter. As roots osmose water, water moves into the plant, is taken into the cells, the soil dries, everything is prehending everything else. Some things are ceasing to be, some things are becoming something completely different. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, um, plants also act maliciously toward uh, other plants sometimes. Um, some plants, in an effort to stake out underground real estate, 
emit chemicals from their roots that are noxious to other species of plants. Um, so a plant's roots who innocently, well not innocently, but you know, doing what it does, you know, spreading around, might actually encounter uh, poison um, uh, put there from the roots of another plant. Um, other plants, uh, still the kind of malicious uh, prehension, uh, malicious interbotanical prehension, um, other plants detect um, fellow plants to prey on. For example, um, the, the daughter vine, a uh, parasite, can, uh, pre well, it prehends, it, it detects, it chemically detects um, the volatile chemicals of a, a tomato plant, which we, we humans can too, because tomato plants have a very strong kind of sweat-like smell. Um, the daughter vine smells those volatile chemicals emitted by the tomato plant and reaches out for it, pierces its skin, and sucks out the juice. <laughs> um, daughter vines can even, if they've got several different uh, tomato plants around them, they can detect which one is the healthiest and choose that one to, uh, to attack. Um, now, I've been using this Whiteheadian um, process philosophy of uh, actual, actual entities and prehensions and talking at the level of uh, a plant, its leaves, its cells. Something important but also kind of bulky about process philosophy is you can use it um, on any level. We can talk about a human prehending, we can talk about um, my cells prehending, we can talk about you know, atoms prehending. So I think it's kind of important when you're using process philosophy to decide on what level you are talking. So when, so one of these events, uh, such as the, the roots of the wilted plant um, drawing up water until the wilted plant uh, becomes refreshed, um, we can, this, such an event is called an actual occasion, and it has a beginning and an end. Um, when the actual occasion is completed, or in Whitehead's term, satisfied, uh, the soil is transformed, the plant is transformed, the water is transformed. And this term, satisfaction, um, means the, the end of apprehension, a kind of um, uh, a death of a certain so in Whitehead, in Whitehead's cosmos, substances, subjects, and objects dissolve into an atomistic flow of actual occasions and actual entities. Um, I'll jump over a little bit. Oh yes, one more nice Whiteheadian term is, um, but instead of uh, using subject and object, since we've uh, seen with these examples, um, each entity prehends the other, each entity is uh, transformed by the other. Um, instead, uh, Whitehead suggests that what emerges from one of these encounters is not uh, a subject, but a, a superject. Uh, so it's a thrown out of the encounter, or ejected from the encounter as a, a new, um, a new thing. So the revived plant is the superject of its uh, prehension of the water. Okay, so I hope that this thinking on a kind of atomistic level, um, in order to appreciate what we have in common with the plants, helps you see that um, it doesn't require, to, thinking about what we have in common with plants, doesn't require us to, uh, to dumb ourselves down. You know, it's not. A, I think it's a terrible insult to say that somebody's a, a vegetable. Um, uh, but I, it's more to the point is to amplify our awareness by pointing out all the kinds of awareness that plants have um, at a micro level, which is a level at which we're not usually paying attention. Of many, our many tiny encounters. And I would suggest that this. Uh, series of micro-perceptions constitutes an aesthetics 
in Whitehead's meaning that aesthetics involves a decision of how to prehend something. So plants have an aesthetics in some of the examples I've been given where they actually decide, they, they don't have to take in all these um, stimuli, they de decide what and how to take in. And um, we too uh, can amplify our own aesthetic prehension by learning to interpret, um, by learning to, to be a little more plant-like in, um, in the way we interpret the signs they make to one another. So once again, um, using our nose and um, uh, um, trying to refine our olfactory perception is uh, a way to do this. So, uh, so far my examples have been about the way plants use chemicals in order to repel. Um, but of course, Plants also emit chemicals that attract pollinators. And this is the come hither gesture of plants that we humans have adopted in our wearing of perfume. But here it's, uh, it's important to emphasize, and we have, it's wonderful to have this thing in common with plants, you know, to go around smelling like roses, say. Um, but also, uh, Plants and their pollinators are um, able to detect or to prehend many, many, many more chemicals than, than we humans are. Um, kind of the way dogs are able to hear um, sounds that, that humans can't hear. We only smell the, the tip of the iceberg, as it were, of the chemicals that plants emit. There's a vast, in, in a weedy corner lot, there's a vast symphony of seduction and repulsion going on, to which we are mostly impervious. So insects are attracted by many, many scents, um, of which uh, we only detect a very few. And it's even a smaller number of those scents that we actually find um, attractive. Now, biologists refer to the to the chemistry of a flower as its headspace, which is a delightful term derived from the, the beer industry for the, uh, the volatile chemicals emitted um, by flower. And botanists have identified more than 1,700 compounds in the floral headspace that um, fall into a number of chemical groups, mainly uh, terpenoids, aliphatics, benzenoids, and phenylpropanoids. And just my very beginning uh, study of this with a, a trusted consultant who knows a lot of um, organic chemistry, my dad, um, <laughs> uh, taught me that the mere flip of, of a carbon string um, in two molecules that are otherwise identical can change the smell completely from, say, something like violet to something like asphalt. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very interesting. If, if uh, you know, any of you are really good at chemistry, I, I really would encourage you to pursue um, this subtle but very powerful, I think they're called um, uh, chemicals that are like mirror, mirror images of each other. Stereoisomers. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think uh, there are families of plants um, that uh, that will emit um, one or another stereoisomer. Um, I know there are anyway, families of uh, chemicals, such as these terpenoids, um, which include stereoisomers that have that really kind of uncanny reversal. Um, OK, so my point there has been that um, there's an enormous number of um, uh, scents being emitted, um, most of which we humans cannot perceive, um, being emitted by flowering plants in order to attract pollinators. And in fact, so at first it's, it seems like that weedy corner lot I was alluding to is like a, a whole lot of small um, broadcast radio stations um, all sending out their signals, interfering with each other, but in fact, most insects ignore the scent cues of plants that they don't pollinate. 
So it's actually a little bit more like a, like a lot of um, individuals sending out um, text messages to select it, or, or I don't know, Twitter feeds or something. It's actually more like mm -hmm. a, a kind of a contemporary narrow cast Is medium. that they ignore them or that they actually don't have the apparatus to detect them? Uh, well, I have read that they ignore them. Okay. I can, uh, I'll, I'll give you that footnote later, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, keep in mind that uh, insects respond to a great number of scents that, that we humans can't smell. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think it's, you know, to kind of, to sort of, to bring the aesthetics back into the human realm a little bit, um, I'd like to consider plants' attractive smells in the light of Elizabeth Gross's argument that uh, the origin of art lies in sexual selection, not natural selection. Um, she asks, why, why do we find the scents and colors of many flowers beautiful? And answers, because we have learned to um, from the flowers and their animal admirers. When we scent ourselves with fragrance and clothe ourselves with pretty colors, we're imitating the siren song of the flowers. So this is a really, this is in the, um, Rose's two recent books, uh, Chaos Territory Art, and the, the more recent book is title I forget. Um, she's uh, intervening <coughs> in the um, uh, cultural discourse in response to Darwin. Usually it's Darwin's account of natural selection um, that people credit, uh, and that strongly informed the modern emphasis on the survival of the fittest and really powerfully um, infiltrated uh, modernist aesthetics um, in terms of the disdain of pleasure, of ornament, of frivolity, of uh, femininity as um, unnecessary to life or perhaps as things that one uh, can have luxuries to have uh, later after one has uh, succeeded in the battle of natural selection. Um, so we can see the influence, we can still see the influence of the, uh, the rhetoric of natural selection in um, some uh, rigorous and joyless aspects of contemporary art. Um, not all, of course, just the rigorous and joyless ones. Um, <laughs> but thinking in the terms of creative evolution, just to bring Bergson back in, it's high time to uh, appreciate the activities of our floral and faunal kin in terms of pleasure, the pleasure and the seemingly useless novelty they engender. Sexual selection, rather than natural selection, redirects living things' energy away from mere survival to uh, seduction, pleasure, uh, curiosity, um, doing things to delight others uh, in, order, in order to attract mates. Um, I don't know if you uh, came across a story in the news one or two years ago that um, uh, the dinosaurs had um, big uh, table feathers that would have spread like, like peacock's tail. Isn't that, isn't that great? So perhaps another reason, I don't know why the dinosaurs died out, is that they were, you know, they were swanning around from each other, but, you know, flirting and showing off. Um, now, if you think that, that, that uh, Rose's ar argument is terribly heterosexist, that it's only about, uh, you know, um, usually males trying to uh, perform to enchant uh, females, she, she says, uh, and I completely agree, that um, no, no, the creation of uh, seduction, beauty, pleasure, novelty, and surprise is something that all genders and sexual preferences um, do for each other and learn from each other. And it's a great, um, it's a great, uh, it's a great way not merely to survive, but to make life worth living by uh, enhancing 
perception and intensifying life. Um, okay, so Rose, she's talking about animals. She doesn't really talk about plants very much in, in chaos territory Earth, but she does argue that we have a world to perceive and a world in which to make art because animals made it and I would add plants as co-creators. So birds sing to attract others as well as warn others. Uh, the male stickleback, as uh, Darwin observed, turns translucent and shimmery in the mating season. Um, flowers produce scents and colors to attract their, attract their pollinators. Um, and because of these, we humans learn about music, about spectacle, about color and scent. Grose writes, it is the animal in us, and I would add, and the plant in us, that directs us to art. Art is the way nature deviates itself from givenness. So we become more than just the human animal by cultivating potentials for new experience, by creating sense experiences beyond our needs. And the flowers and plants play a large role in teaching us how to do this. So in these ways, in these ways we experience beauty because plants and insects do. And in addition, when we experience the healing and toxic powers of plants, we're able to do this because the plants made a world for us. Um, incidentally, uh, another recent research nugget suggests that the coffee plant um, invented caffeine to help the bees remember where it is. <laughs> Isn't that great? I don't know. Um, so even when we get caffeinated, we're, uh, we're engaging in this um, plant and animal communication. Um, but I was, just, I was already starting to talk about the useful properties of plants again, and I, I don't want to do that. Rather, I want to follow Elizabeth Rose's Deleuzean lead in appreciating the way nature creates intensifications. For these, these are the reasons we humans create and are drawn to beauty and novelty. So, finally, uh, it's time to smell um, slide number two. <laughs> okay, start really trying to guess what it is. Jasmine? Hyacinth? Hyacinth? Lilac and Lilac Valley? Good guesses. Um, the one who said Jasmine. Who said Jasmine? You guessed the closest. Um, it's, uh, well, I know this as uh, my first introduction to this scent was uh, uh, food, uh, an Arabic name uh, for a flower. It's an oil, um, it's oil of food that I, I bought in the uh, Damascus in happier days, <laughs> and uh, I never really knew what food was. I just knew that it's a very strong smelling flower. People told me it's a, it's a tiny flower, um, but there is a, there's an Egyptian uh, greeting. Um, so normally in an Arabic you, in, you say sabah al khair, sabah al nur, which means uh, uh, good morning, the morning light, but you can say Sabah al which means uh, a morning of food to you, a morning of this fragrant flower. It's a beautiful greeting. Um, and then Cairo, lovers buy flowers of full, and taxi drivers hang garlands of full from <coughs> rear view mirrors. Apparently, I'm told, I haven't seen it. But you can buy a potted full in Cairo, and uh, uh, I would have shown you the picture of my, my food um, pot. But anyway, it's a very modest looking plant. Um, it's nothing to look at at all, really. Really, just nothing. Uh, it's um, called wild jasmine or Arabian jasmine, though um, it originates in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's jasminium sandak. It's pollinated at night by moths, and uh, it has a where are my legs? Um, yeah, it has a very strong uh, 
cloying, somebody said, odor. Um, so when we smell the fool, we are uh, becoming moth for a moment and uh, sharing the insect's attraction to the flower's sexual lure. And uh, back on a human and social scale, we're also sharing the pleasure of the scent with people in Syria and Egypt who, uh, who share it with each other and perfor perfume their clothes with full and greet each other um, by mentioning full. Or, or they say, um, I washed your car uh, like full. It's like it's really, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so the bouquet of uh, fragrant flowers, that headspace, can contain just a few chemicals or over a hundred. Uh, the oil of jasminium sunbak is a mixture of many chemicals, including the fragrant kumaran, uh, which or kumarin, which is smells like new mown hay, linalool, a spicy floral scent, and methyl and thralinate, which smells like grape. Hmm. Give it another whiff. Try to smell, because I actually do smell the kumaran, the new mown hay. It's got a kind of hay-like, kind of a dry, grassy smell, right? That's the kumaran. Um, the spicy floral, that's probably the top note, linalool. Those are all in there for you to detect. Um, and other chemicals that have uh, medicinal properties. Uh, it's used to flavor jasmine tea. It's an antioxidant. It's an antidepressant. And traditionally, it's been used to treat ailments from depression to cancer. So, when we scent ourselves with oil of food, we borrow the flower's moth seductive powers to attract other humans. And when we administer fool to treat anxiety or illness, we're drawing on the floral knowledge within ourselves, on our own fool-like nature. Now you might say, well, aren't we really drawing on our moth-like nature? And isn't this whole lecture really a lecture about becoming more like insects? Um, I have a little uh, Whiteheadian uh, faint uh, around that argument. And here it is. Uh, whose experience are we sharing when we smell plants? Well, when we smell that uh, call for help um, that you smell with the uh, balsam fir, um, oh, and by the way, um, I don't know, I won't give you any other call for help examples. It's already you know, sad enough <laughs> um, to think that when we smell plants, we're like, oh, oh that smells nice. They're probably going, oh, I'm being attacked. Um, we share the experience of pollinators attracted to flower scents, and so we become like the insects. Sure. But I think because we're talking about interactions at this molecular level, at a chemical level, I would like to think that at a chemical level, there's not so much distinction between self and other, uh, between um, smelly and smeller. Uh, I think that we become like plants. Um, plants, for example, when one plant is being uh, pollinated, surely the plants around are, are noticing that the pe their peer is uh, being pollinated and, uh, and acting accordingly. Uh, excuse the sexist metaphor, but like a room of printing debutantes. <laughs> In smelling, therefore, I argue we're cultivating our insect <coughs> nature and our plant nature. So I return to Whitehead. It's not necessary to separate subject and object, smeller and smelly. In the moment of chemical communication, all parties enter into an actual occasion where we prehend those parts of each other that are relevant to us. Both chemistry and process philosophy emphasize that a delicate and precise meeting takes place at the molecular level, in a mimetic dance between the chemistry at several levels, the plant signal, and that of its receptors in other, in other plants and animals, including us. We chemically press close to each other and take each other's shape. At the molecular level, there's no subject-object. Rather, there's a mutual becoming 
an event in which all parties become transformed. Aromatic events, then, mean chemical communication acts on us at a level that doesn't distinguish human, animal, and plant. We are, in Whitehead's term, the superject of that olfactory moment. At this animistic level, we do indeed have much in common with plants, as well as with the index that pollinate, insects that pollinate, predate, and protect them. And these mutual becomings between flower and insect, fragrance and nose, make us atomistic kin with all others who have experienced the scream of the Balkan cat. I'd love to hear your thoughts of any sort. I have a comment that because all life forms are carbon-based life forms, and they're all based on these same chains of carbon, you know, the six carbon three, and everything's based on that, so it makes sense that there would be communications between them. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah, this isn't, you know, we could, uh, instead of bifurcating between, you know, women and men, uh, animals and plants, we could just like, you know, these further levels we go down, um, the more commonalities we find. So yeah, they can say, well, we're all carbon-based creatures. But then are we going to declare war on, on the silicon-based uh, entities? <laughs> um, but yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I completely agree. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, it can be quite uncanny to, um, and because, yes, they're all carbons, but, um, those molecules vary so enormously. Uh, nature is, is so creative. So it's kind of amazing that we're all surfing that same wave of uh, carbon. I, I do, um, I wonder about empathy, though. The comment you said about us enjoying the smell that is released out of pain. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and just where that line is in terms of relating. Yeah. Um, because you, you talk about not uh, <coughs> separating and and, uh, uh, and being able to uh, understand and mm -hmm. relate. Uh, so what did you thought about that in terms um, of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and it's a real problem. Um, the more we, uh, I mean, probably some people here are already uh, vegetarians, It's a 
survival and that of the plants around. Right, that's my question. So what's the point of telling the other plants? Is it kind of a mutual agreement? You know, like you watch my back, I'll watch yours. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, well, I'm, you know, based on based on my research, um, you know, uh, plants that are all of the same. Um, Uh, or even um, you know, groups of plants that, that have evolved uh, symbiotically. Yeah, you know, I imagine that it's in their interest to um, for the for the whole group to be in good health. So if one plant, so well that that drought example I gave at the beginning, if one plant feels the effect of drought, it emits chemicals that tells the plant around plants around it, um, you know, close up your pores. It's you know, we're a team, we're yeah. severing a drought. Yeah, it's like, see, it's, yeah, so that everybody can survive together. It's, it's, in, it's in all their interest. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can you elaborate a little bit about that, the process? Process philosophy? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, process philosophy is uh, uh, random philosophy that is very ancient. It goes back to the pre-Socratics, uh, Democritus and Lucretius. Um, you know, went, up, went underground in the West for about 2,000 years, came back into fashion in the 19th century. Um, there's a lot of uh, Western process philosophy. And in, uh, in the Eastern Muslim world, especially Iran, um, since uh, Mullah Sadra, uh, process philosophy is actually kind of the, the norm in um, modern Iranian philosophy. Uh, what philosoph process philosophy um, takes, so, you know, the more, and actually I think, I don't know much about this, but I imagine, imagine that a lot of East Asian philosophy is also very comparable to process philosophy. So, where um, the kind of philosophy, Western philosophy that we're more uh, uh, familiar with takes some um, substances as the basic things in the world. It says, you know, what is a horse? What is a man? You know, what is, I don't know, a substance? It defines them and then takes substances as the basics for ontological building blocks. Uh, process philosophy takes a process as the building block and considers that the substances that um, get generated, change, you know, destroyed, dispersed, uh, renewed in the course of a process are like byproducts of that process. So it's a different way of thinking about the world. Process philosophy. Um, process philosophy has come uh, very much in vogue in um, in the world of uh, us cultural theorists who don't read deeply into philosophy, but uh, we connect to it by reading very popular philosophy. Um, so Deleuze and Gattari were very strongly influenced by Alfred North Whitehead. So a lot of Deleuzeans, like me, are going back and reading Whitehead, finally. But in fact, as I said, you know, our sober colleagues over in the philosophy department have been doing this for, for decades. Yes. First off, thank you. You're it was welcome. a very fascinating uh, presentation. Now you've, you've whet my appetite to learn so much more about all, all so many things you talked about. But there was one point that I didn't quite understand, so maybe you can refresh my memory on it. The idea of the boom belt. I, oh, yes. I wrote down that it's some kind of a filtering bubble around us, so it, it blocks certain things and we see certain things, and I'm wondering then if that is what has broken our connection then with the plant uh, kingdom? Uh, uh, that's not the way that um, uh, Jakob von Uschkuhl intended it. Uh, I, um, uh, he didn't think of this as a sort of like a, a, a block, but just considered that every, every creature has an umwelt, which I guess in German means a fundamental world. Also means? just means environment. Environment. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, but in this context, so it's, it's more it's like a fundamental world. That's, okay, so thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what, what uh, Van Dushkul emphasizes is it's, it's a way for us to think about the experience of other creatures. Mm -hmm. 
um, uh, as a um, perceptible and uh, equilibrial uh, environment, and to think about what senses are important or what um, what experiences are important to different kinds of creatures. So he starts with the, the tick, um, or one of his famous examples is the tick, because the umfeld of a tick is very simple. It needs uh, um, it needs to sense heat um, so that it knows when the animal is passing by. Uh, it needs um, gravity so that it can fall on the passing animal. And it needs uh, something else that allows it to burrow into the fur. So, um, but if we get up to a more complex, uh, I think even certain plants are more complex than ticks. But anyway, the Umfeld, getting back to your question, um, I, I, I really think, and I think a lot of philosophers, a lot of uh, philosophers suggest that each of us um, perceives the world uh, according to our needs. You know, Bergson says that, for example. For Bergson, it is a problem that um, we're not able to perceive everything because we're so self-interested. But for von Duschkohl, um, it's an opportunity for us to consider the way other other creatures and other other living entities experience the world. So it doesn't have to be a barrier. But yes, for for Bergson, what you said is perfect. Hmm. So what then is it? Has broken our connection? Oh, has broken our connection? Yeah, the plant kingdom there. Oh. In in two words or less. <laughs> Life is complicated. Yeah, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just piggybacking on that. Uh, for von uh you know, there's a, a divergence, a fundamental divergence between basically the rest of the animal kingdom and humans. Mm. In that, you know, uh, the animal kingdom is very automated in its responses to stimuli. Mm. So the stick, you know, gets. The tick gets a stimulus that there's an animal beneath it and it falls. Yeah. And it doesn't have uh, intervening capacity to reason or to deliberate about or anything. It's a kind of uh, on-off switch situation that's quite mechanistic. Whereas people, everything is hyper-mediated through consciousness, which obfuscates everything. Uh, so it seems like you're trying to bridge that divide to finesse that proposition. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, that yeah, that, that's, a nice, that's a nice way to put it. And you, you know about more about uh, Van Uschkel than, than I do. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, try, I'm really, yeah, I'm not trying to you know, level the playing field um, between, between humans and plants. Um, but in talking about um, you know, plants' decision making, um, and then, you know, I haven't really talked about I haven't talked about how we are like, I guess I talked about how we are like plants. Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. That was my topic. And by the way, I'm very sympathetic to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think I am trying to define a middle, a middle ground. Um, yeah, of course, you know, our, you know, we, we know very well that we humans are not, you know, conscious cognitive decision makers. Um, and maybe those, for example, those smells that do not, that we're not aware of actually like, you know, have a lot to do with our activity. But this, you know, I think maybe, maybe I'm um, uh, trying to sort of elevate our respect for the plant so that um, rather than uh, diminish ourselves, to say, wow, it's so great that we have so much in common with plants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually don't have a problem with diminishing ourselves because I feel like I can't say his name. But to, to separate humans from animals is like, to me, it's like putting ourselves up on this pedestal, but I think it's a false pedestal. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're, I think we are just animals. We just think we're special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I see, I just, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of a, it's a question of sort of emphasis or rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Carrie Lynn? Um, to sort of bring it back to the sort of semiotic level, though, mm -hmm. um, couldn't it be conceived that, you know, if these chemicals are, in fact, uh, 
semiotic signals that we are kind of in, in a sense, sharing the same, the same kind of mm -hmm. readings of things. Because I was thinking about how certain kinds of fragr fragrances, like uh, that, are sort of more sexual in nature, like floral scents. Mm -hmm. Like there is a sexual semiotic kind of sign that we are kind of taking on as well. So on this, like. Does that kind of make sense? Like on this uh -huh. level, yeah. kind of there is a connection, I guess. It, yeah, it, it does. I mean, there, there, in some of those scents we use, um, we are using them in exactly the same way that the flower was using them. You know, mm -hmm. you know they serve. They're saying, "Fuck me." Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but in fact, you know, in the um, you know, some time ago, I was doing a lot of uh, research into the, the compositions of perfumes, and they're actually they're incredibly diverse and you know really quite um, tr troublingly uh, close and distant. Um, I think they're okay. So, like the, the the base note of a perfume is often a, a musk. You know, like from the uh, the um, musk gland of the civet cat and you know it's like a it's like a very animal um, scent or ambergris um, so especially ba base notes of perfumes seem to be very close to our own um, our own animal sexual smells so in fact you know it seems that we modern humans you know, wash ourselves very well to get rid of our own animal smells um, and then we replace them with other animal smells, um, sexual smells. Um, but then, because perfumes have like you know, base, middle, and top notes, we also add uh, flowers' sexual smells. I forget what the middle notes are. Maybe that's that that kumara, that kind of you know, that pneumo and haze sort of thing. Kind of. Um, so it's very interesting that rather than uh, just go around you know exposing our armpits and genitals to each other. We're masking those odors with the odors of um, other creatures that, uh, other living beings um, that share. But the thing is, they do. It's not arbitrary, uh, but it's also not entirely determined, as you were suggesting. Um, this so there is there is some kind of willfulness in the uh, semiotic interpretation. Um, one of the one of the fundamental categories of um, smells, I think that Aristotle came up with, but that it, it seems to me is actually actually quite uh, continuous in the history of smell, is goatee. Um, and my, my memory of this is a little bit rusty, and I don't want to offend anybody, um, but I think that that, that goatee smell, maybe Aristotle, associated with um, Female genitals and uh, oh, goats, obviously, <laughs> um, and other things, you know, goat cheese, I suppose. And one, just one more thing. So what I'm saying is, that I don't remember this very well, but there's, there's, there are chemical similarities, but not exact. Um, I was uh, toying with um, bringing you a third smell uh, slide, um, which is a smell that it. It has a very strong body, a very strong and specific body odor smell. That I won't say exactly what it is, but you would know it if you smelled it. And people are people smell it and they're like, ooh. <laughs> um, and then I say it's truffle oil, and they're like, ah, oh, oh thank God, <laughs> oh I love truffles. Uh, yeah, and here too, I don't remember the chemistry exactly, but the um, you probably know that the female truffle hound, which is actually a pig, right, um, is used to hunt the truffles because it smells like you know her mate. So the chem the uh, so the truffle, right? There's like this chemical collusion across species. But as I said, you know, uh, we're not talking, the fungus are not 
the fungi are not on the table. <laughs> now you know why. <laughs> We've got time for three more questions. Um, I was wondering if there's any research on the phenomenon maybe of hypochondria in plants. Like you were saying that there's a nick and then there's the actual uh, danger and if a plant ever falsely omits the dangerous um, stimulus. Mm -hmm. Because that would kind Have of you come across of, this? You're just wondering if it happens. No, I'm wondering if there is a Hypochondriac plants. <laughs> <laughs> Hypochondriac plants. Because it would be an interesting parallel. It would be very interesting. I imagine that you could induce hypochondria in a plant mm -hmm. if you were still in plant. But I haven't come across such research. No. <coughs> but maybe when we uh, plant owners fuss over our plants too much, we make them hypochondria. <laughs> maybe, really. No. They, think they're, they, they think they're dying but because we're just loving them. Too much. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then you, are you making putting your hand up, or are you just making your hand? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, okay. <laughs> do um, smell perceptions map directly onto chemicals, or is it more like um, envision with color? Where if I see blue, then that doesn't necessarily correspond to, to any particular kind of substance? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, molecules actually fit in like a walking cave. You have chemoreceptors that actually, mm -hmm. they actually do fit in there like quite nicely. Mm -hmm. I thought that was under debate. Well, I, I, I have an answer, also, <laughs> um, which is that uh, and yet what you are describing is true, but at, at a, uh, a cognitive level, uh, it's very difficult for us to identify a smell um, without identifying the thing that it is the smell of. Mm -hmm. right. um, mm -hmm. And this, this, I think this is partly a cultural thing, just that we, you know, in most cultures, we don't uh, really cultivate an olfactory um, vocabulary. But I think it's just also kind of a, a human um, a human weakness, perhaps it hasn't been. We haven't really needed that for survival. So yeah, all kinds of olfaction is going on, but we tend um, we tend to be stymied uh, as to what we're actually smelling. Um, but as soon as we get the the name, research shows we can actually smell it better. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not bad. It's like oh, you stupid humans are so cultural, you can't even smell something. It's just it's something about how uh, about the neurophysiology of olfaction. That once once we know what something is, um, we seem to be more able to to identify it. Maybe if you've lost it, you can sort of through the name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or yeah, if if you know what the name. You know, it's probably because um, uh, smell, smell memory is strongly encoded with experience, uh, apparently more, more so than other sense memories, um, especially uh, an emotional experience. So I think when we get the word for smell, um, uh, say, say it's a new, new moon hay, um, uh, you can probably smell that note in the, um, the, the, the Arabian jasmine better because you might have some associations with, with new moon hay. It's indexical. Mm -hmm. It's indexical and it's emotionally indexical. But this is also, just to digress a little bit, this is why smell is not, um, it's not a good broadcasting sense, I, I mean um, uh, modality because humans encode uh, different emotions and different memories around smells. So we do have a cultural, you know, cultural commonalities, um, and a common cultur cultural associations with smell, and there's a very few smells that um, uh, we do have uh, hardwired responses to, like you know, excrement and putrefaction, but mostly, there's a kind of cultural commonality, 
Um, so we say, oh yeah, you know, gingerbread, smells like Christmas. Uh, um, or uh, certain perfumes are you know, very strong coated. But then every individual has his or her associations with the smell. And some people have very fond associations and some you know, might have terrible associations. So my, my thesis is that it's not a good um, you know, broadcasting. Well, that's how it responds to change. Like if you're in an environment of the smell, you don't notice it anymore. Right. It's, we're set up so that it's new smell, fully smell, not yeah. not what's around us all the time. Mm -hmm. like yeah. You can't smell your own house unless you go away on vacation and come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems like a seems like a survival thing. Mm -hmm. But do I was going to uh, come back to you. If you well, I did a reading on a piece that you wrote, and you talked about um, repression in a socialization. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to read the line I'm thinking of? Sure. Or you might. Is um, that uh, thinking multisensory culture? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there is an aspect of smell uh, experience that's learned but not communicable, namely those olfactory events that are important in an individual's life but repressed as part of general social socialization. Can you talk a little bit about that? And because oh. I put a question mark beside it, and I thought, you know, why would we do that? Um, is, is it like with the insects, you know, they're gaining something by excluding certain smells? Mm -hmm. um, I think that is what I was just saying. Would you mind just reading the next sentence in case that <laughs> okay. I contradict my stuff? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, smell populates the, the imaginary for it has intense personal associations that are difficult to communicate. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned for <coughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's basically what I was uh, what I was just talking about. Although what I was just talking about didn't require um, repression per se. Mm -hmm. um, but in an example I've used elsewhere, so I think it's kind of funny. But of course, it's not really funny. Okay, I'm not going to use an example. Yeah. Um, you know. So I say most. So say most. You smelled. Um, okay. Let's say like. Okay. Let's say uh, Arabian jasmine. Um, you know, maybe uh, the first, maybe one time when you smelled or when I smelled Arabian jasmine um, was the same day that I got violently ill, or um, you know somebody you know, smacked me or something. Um, then uh, because that was very strong, or um, I learned something very unique and specific. Uh, uh, to gave me a thrill. Um, I think, it's not that I think, I have learned that um, we, we encode a, a private meaning for a smell when, when it's a smell that we don't smell all the time and the smelling of it is accompanied by a strong emotional event. So that's because of the neural process of all action. <laughs> So those are the things that we can't, we want to have in common. You know, one person associates uh, uh, Arabian jasmine with uh, a bad day, another with getting sick, another with you know being you know shocked at uh, um, you know like the sunlight suddenly coming into her eyes um, one day, and one person really just has a kind of generic association. So I'm still not, I don't remember exactly what I meant by repression there, because my examples here are not about repression per se. They're just about, it's not, um, uh, it's not useful to communication to bring in those, con those personal associations. So it's a little bit like the insects that you were talking about, where they, they're um, ignoring smells? Um, yeah. Except that it would, I mean, because, actually, I think I do, I think I know why I was said repression. Because if they are, you know, if they do come with powerful emotions, um, they do need to repress those and repress the memories that they call up in order, um, you know, just to carry on the conversation. Thank you very much, Laura. Thanks for